Hi, blockchain and cryptography enthusiasts. Welcome to Ziki Marek, where I explain the inner workings of all things crypto. Before we start, we would to thank Ecosystem Support Program and VLayer for helping making this video happen. Previously on ZK Marek. Elliptic curves used in cryptography are sets of points defined over prime fields with an elliptic curve equation. There is an arithmetic of points living on the curve. A point can be negated, two points can be added, and a point can be multiplied by a scalar. Amazingly, you can do a fast scalar multiplication, however the inverse operation, a discrete logarithm, is infeasible. At least for properly chosen curve standards like SEICP 256K1. It is a standard used by Bitcoin and Ethereum with specific equation, order of prime field and generator point. Thanks to that, you can construct an Ethereum wallet with the private key being just a random scalar, and the public key being a point on a curve, which is simply a designated generator point multiplied by a private key. Finally, to obtain an Ethereum address from the public key, hash it and truncate the end. And now, you are ready to understand how digital signature secures Ethereum transactions and in particular how elliptic curve digital signature algorithm works. Traditionally, digital signature schemes consist of three algorithms. Generate, sign and verify. Firstly, generate obtains a private key and a public key. A private key and secret key is used interchangeably. Sign takes a message with a private key and returns a signature. Verify takes a message signature and public key and returns a boolean. True if signature is correct and false otherwise. However, that would not work for Ethereum as you cannot obtain a public key from the address, only the other way around. Therefore, you have to use another signature algorithm instead. Recover. Recover takes two arguments, message and signature, and returns a public key. From that, you can calculate an Ethereum address to validate the transaction. In context of elliptic curves, variants of digital signature algorithms are often prefixed with EC. Now, Let's take a closer look at the types. To make a proper private key, take a random scalar. In this context by scalar, we mean a random number between 0 and n, the order of the elliptic curve group. Don't confuse it with prime field order, often designated by p, which is quite a close number in case of SECP 256k1, but can be very different in case of other curve standards. Public key is a point on a curve, so a pair of elements in a prime field. A message is a string for bytes that you will need to convert to a number. You can do it by calculating a hash and treating it as a scalar. R and S are scalars. V is a bit more tricky, so we will return to it later. You can think of digital signatures as a game for two players. The first player, let's call him signatory, owns a pair of private and public keys. He also have a message, a string of bytes. And his goal is to create a signature so that he can convince the other player, let's call him verifier, that the message was signed by him, the owner of the private key. A private key, which in case of Ethereum is basically your wallet, is just a large securely generated random number. A public key is a scalar multiplication of the private key and the generator point from the standard we are using. By the way, Ethereum address is just a shortened hash of the public key. We will also need to carry the message from the world of bytes to the world of mathematics. And we can do so by simply calculating a hash of a message and treating the result as it is another large number. And we are ready to create a signature. First, we will need to generate another random number, the secret. We will also generate public R, which is obtained by doing scalar multiplication of the secret and the generator. But we are going to share the X coordinate of it and we'll designate it as a small r. From r, we can recover y coordinate quite easily. We'll use our secret to encapsulate and obfuscate the message and the key in one variable called s. What is s? It is message plus r multiplied by the private key and multiplied by a secret inverted. Or you might say, divided by the secret. And we store the value modular curve order. We can simplify in the case of SECP256K1 
as prime field order and the curve order are the same. So we'll skip that aspect in further considerations. Now the game moves to the other player, whose job will be to retrieve the signatory of the message using the hash of the message and the signature. From that, he can retrieve an error point or two candidates for any given x. And he calculates two auxiliary values, u1, which is minus message times r inverted, and u2, which is not a rock band, but s time r inverted. From that, q is calculated, which equals u1 times g plus u2 times r. If q equals public key, then the signature is correct. How come? Let's see. First, let's plug all the variables in our equation, starting with r. And we can see instantly we can factor out g in front of the bracket. And now we can substitute u1 and u2. And we can substitute s as well. And we can see that the secret and the inversion of the secret cancel each other out. While multiplying the content of the bracket by r to the minus 1, we can further reduce r. And even more reductions. Getting q to the point where it should equal the very definition of a public key. q will equal public key if and only if a proper private public key pair is used, as well as proper secret and r combination is used as well. Note that the algorithm uses a random number k. Earlier, we called it secret, which means that signature is not deterministic. Now, this is not the property we appreciate when signing Ethereum transactions. We would like the transaction to be deterministic. So when we sign a transaction two times, we get the same transaction hash. You can achieve determinism by substituting a random element with a deterministic value calculated using hmax from a private key and a message. For our purpose, you can think of hmax as hash on steroids. However, if you ask experts, they will tell you this is gross oversimplification. And there is a nuance to address. Mathematically, both S and N minus S are proper signatures. Therefore, to make sure, you can produce two proper signatures. Ethereum asserts that S is smaller than half of N. Now we have a puzzle to solve. The EC recover function has arguments S, R, and V. We discussed S and R in detail. But what is V? And we can look at Ethereum transaction. It has a bunch of fields that needs to be signed by the private key owner. The signature is a part of transaction and it is stored in fields S, R, and V. And we can discover that V has one of four values, 0, 1, 27, and 28. Why so bizarre? As you probably remember, the value R is an X coordinate of the point capital R generated from the secret. There are two possible Y values for any given X. Therefore, a binary variable is very helpful to inform which one of the two it is. But why for values? Well, back in the early days of Ethereum, and even further in the past when Bitcoin was designed, 0 and 1 were used. Later, 27 and 28 were introduced to avoid accidental sets to 0. But 0 and 1 remain valid input till today for backwards compatibility. And so we have our mystery solved. Now that you have a sense how ECDSA works, Take a look at the code of the EC sign function. It takes a private key, message hash and pre-computed value k. It returns a tuple of three elements, r, s, and v. First, we calculate r and s values according to the algorithm from the earlier slide. Then it calculates v and flips s and v if the s value is greater than half of the group order. Finally, it returns r, s, and v. And the recovery function takes a message hash and private key in the form of three integer values, r, s, and v. It is pretty straightforward. It tries to recover elliptic curve point capital R from lowercase r. For given r, there are at least two possibilities. v is hinting which one to pick. If this is successful, it will follow calculations from the earlier slide to return the public key. Keep in mind that production code gets much more complicated as it needs to handle serialization and edge cases according to the standard. For signature generation, we will also have to generate k. Yet at the heart of it is fairly simple code, with just a few lines of it for each algorithm. 
Now you know in detail how the digital signature algorithm works. Thanks for watching ZK Marek channel.